Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chai Sai Chat Season 2. This is an exclusive interdisciplinary talk show featuring interviews with folks about creativity, the arts, healing, personal growth, spirituality, identity, representation, among many other topics. I am your host, Aishwarya, and for this episode, we are going to be talking about the creative arts and process of writing. So my first guest is a critically acclaimed radio host and author whose debut novel, Haunting Bombay, received the first Words Literary Prize for South Asian writers. Some of her academic scholarship has also centered around post-colonial literature, women's studies, and healing modalities in yogic traditions. My second guest is a multimedia artist and scholar researcher whose work revolves around identity formation, representation, and cultural studies. In addition to studying media and journalism at UNC Chapel Hill, she's also a trained Bharatanatyam dancer and a filmmaker who uses her interdisciplinary talents through collaborations with other artists. Please welcome Shilpa Agarwal and Madhavi Reddy. Hi, ladies. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to Chai Side Chat. Um, Thank you for having us. Yeah. So I want to start with uh, just a question about writing, since that's sort of our overall topic for today. Um, and I imagine both of you have kind of dabbled in different types of writing. So um, sort of first two part question that I have, the first part is like, what is different about writing for academia or doing scholarship and research compared to other types of writing like fiction, for example? And then sort of the second part of that is, do you have a personal writing practice like journaling or something that you do that's just for yourself that's not really related to some of the other professional things of writing that you do? My practice uh, is that I do both academic and fictional writing, and I came from academia. Um, my doctoral work was at UCLA in post-colonial studies. And um, when I left to write my first novel, a lot of that stayed with me. And um, so my fictional work tends to be very research oriented in terms of really delving into um, histories that were lost or unseen and kind of excavating them as well as bringing in the theory. So I've been working on a trilogy for the past, um, past 10, 12 years. And it's taken a long time, partly because I've been doing many other things, but partly because I am always bringing that kind of critical theoretical lens to what I write and the uh, intense research. And, um, and so, you know, doing, obviously one is more right brain and one is more left brain, but they both to me involve the same kind of processes of inquiry and, um, and research. And um, as far as my daily writing practice, um, you know, it's, it's a daily writing practice. I don't think that there's any, I think in my younger years, I thought, oh, I need like a quiet place and like candlelight and all that kind of stuff. And that went out the window quickly when I had children. Um, now it's, you know, it's, it's when you can grab the moment, if it's important to you, you prior, whatever you prioritize in your life, you will do. And so it's a priority and um, it's hard to make something a priority when it's, when there's blocks and when you're struggling, but you have to, but I have continued to try my best to make it a priority. And so um, I write pretty much every day. And even if nothing comes out, and I always say this to my kids, even if you write the dog sat on a log, you've shown up and you've written that terrible sentence. And then, you know, the poison has to come out of the churning of that creative ocean before the elixir can rise. So that's me. That's really, really uh, useful to hear. Um, I have pretty much no experience in, that's not true. I have some experience in fictional writing through writing film scripts. Um, and that's like you said, a very creative process. But what I was gonna say with academic writing for me is academic writing is very much centered on what is your contribution to the literature? What is your contribution to the big debates happening in the field? And so when you're thinking about topics and you're thinking about how to write academically, you're thinking pretty much about, okay, what have people said and what, am I gonna, what new thing am I gonna say to take these conversations forward? So for example, right now I'm working on my dissertation that looks at South Asian American media representation. And so when I write, and I'm still in the early stages, but when I think about a topic like this, I think, okay, 
in the field of broader field of Asian American studies, Asian American studies tends to sideline South Asian American experiences. So if I have a book, oftentimes there will just be one or two chapters. Or if I have an article, there will just be one or two units of analysis. So in coming up with a dissertation that deals with South Asian American media representation, I'm contributing to this larger body of Asian American studies literature by bringing in this understudied perspective. Similarly, um, in the research, another research stream I have on uh, race, diaspora, and mis and disinformation, studies of mis and disinformation have often been very Anglo-centric. So in bringing in perspectives about Asian Americans and bringing in, for example, I'm working on a study with a group right now where we look at WhatsApp and WeChat and how mis and disinformation spreads in these transnational Asian spaces. That is contributing to the literature by bringing in a new perspective and sort of resisting the Anglo-centricity of that literature. So that's sort of, I think, the crux of academic writing. Um, when it comes to personal writing um, and for wellness, I keep a journal. I often write in my journal. It's just a great way to let thoughts out. It's a great stress buster. Um, and it keeps it, what's so interesting about that is with academic writing, you're constantly conscious about how you say things. And so it's nice to have that foil, the journal space where I don't have to think about that at all. Yeah, yeah. A lot of when you both are talking about just kind of your personal writing practices or just having some kind of commitment to that, um, I'm reminded of um, in this book, The Artist's Way, the author talks about how there's like a, I think it's like a two or three page just just free flow, just write whatever is coming up for you, like three pages every day. Uh, I mean, it's it's more of like a ritualized thing over a larger period of time, but I think that that really reminded me of that when you both were speaking to like your own personal practices. So, um, so the other question sort of related to writing is um, self-doubt and writer's block, I think that often comes up for a lot of people. Um, and so as writers and artists yourselves, how do you work with writer's block or creator's block or just the inner critic when it does come up? Like, are there particular affirmations or rituals or anything that kind of helps ground you and center you in um, feeling more supported when these challenges do come up? Um, what came to mind first for me was this book called The War of Art. And um, it, you know, it talks about the, the, the force of resistance and um, there, resistance is a real force that's there. And even when we, we feel it, even when we are trying to transform our life, like to eat better or to exercise every day or to whatever, there's a force of resistance that is just like, no, I want those that sweet. I want to like lie in bed with my blanket and watch TV. There is this kind of thing that's pushing us to, to, to kind of keep Oh, you know, keep into our same self, keep our habits and who we are the same. I feel like the force, like the force of the cosmos is about dynamism and it's about change and it's about transformation and that takes effort. And so we have to continuously put that effort in to um, um, transform our lives. And, um, and that includes like whatever we want to manifest in the world. And I feel like the bigger and closer we get to that manifestation, the more that the force of resistance is upon us. And sometimes it's the biggest obstacle you have to overcome before you can break through and receive what you need to. So it's a constantly like, oh, here comes being conscious. Here comes another obstacle. Here's comes resistance. I really don't want to write today. My writing is terrible today or there's nothing why am I doing this was even what am I doing with my life and so I think that's um that constant like pushing back against the resistance transcending it um taking that thing that's coming at you and kind of ducking and kind of weaving and continuing to put energy out the other thing I would say is I have a fantastic writing partner and I have for years and uh we have a commitment to each other and that that involves accountability and so we give each other five pages of our writing every week and uh, we talk every Friday and we return each other's pages and that is like a jolt of life force into my writing because then it's like there's I'm not just writing in this room 
there's a conversation happening with someone else and it's, it's, and it's accountability. And so I think that can help the process of writing, having a community, even if it's academic writing, having feedback. And I think as still a PhD student, to that point, um, having my advisor and having deadlines and people that I, I have to submit things to, that's something that um, sort of helps me go and builds accountability and all of those things. Um, and one of the things I was gonna say is, um, they're not very philosophical, but my sort of go-to things I do is for writer's block is I exercise when I can't think. So I go outside and I ride my bike and I breathe in fresh air. Um, I might practice dance, I might go for a walk. Um, and usually that tends to help me. Another thing is that I find environment is key. During the pandemic, a lot of us were stuck in environments that were not conducive to productivity. But uh, for me, I know I rely on coffee shops a lot just having that external stimulation and um, watching people and having like a drink that I really like. So environment is definitely key and finding a space where you can churn out the most amount of work I think is very helpful. Um, also, we obviously look at our computers a lot. So something I like to do is print out my manuscripts and cut them out and write in them. And, and that's kind of a, a way to change things up such that your experience is new when you're writing and you might get more insights doing a different function. Um, to your point about the inner critic, I think that's a very real thing. Self-doubt is extremely real for many of us. Uh, one, I have not figured out how to overcome that yet, but one thing that I try to do is I try to forgive myself. I try to go a little easier on myself um, and tell myself it's okay. If, if right now you're not able to do something, that's okay, do something else, it'll come back to you. Um, you've already produced this much, so you will get it done. Can I just add to your point that I agree with that? I think that that was really great of you to bring up because I think we are caught in a capitalist system and as well as paradigms of coloniality. And um, part of the capitalist system is this pressure to produce, like only when you're producing are you somehow valuable member of the society and everybody on social media is like, oh, I've done this and I'm going out with this and I've done that. And, you know, for years I was like, what am I, I'm packing my kids' lunches, I'm sweeping the floor, I'm like doing a little bit of freelance, like, you, you know, if you take on a project like a dissertation or a book like you're doing or a trilogy like I'm doing, which is long-term, I don't have anything to post or to say or to show about who I am. I just know that it's about the work, the daily work. And, and of course those voices come in like, well, are you crazy? Like, what are you doing? Um, but I think that there's, when you have a calling to do something, it gives you that energy um, to keep going. Yeah, I think one thing that both of you are sort of speaking to is this idea of like, product oriented, which is definitely what, like you said, the capitalist framework is sort of pushing us towards. And then how that is very different from like more process oriented writing or art making. And this is something I had talked about in a previous episode of Tri Side Chats with some of my guests about how those two are so different and how one is more heavily valued than the other in our society and in our systems. And so, um, yeah, part of my hope, even with this kind of initiative is like to kind of create community around sharing some of those struggles when it comes to just being in the process and how even that can be challenging sometimes like with this, you know, with the self-doubt and with the inner critiquing of like, am I doing enough that that often comes up. I think a lot of artistic process is very like, it takes time, right? And it, like an idea needs spaciousness to kind of develop whether that's written work or movement or dance or music or whatever it is, I think the, the one thing that I've realized for myself is that I need a lot of spaciousness for some, for me to feel more like connected to my creativity and my creative potential. So, um, yeah, and that kind of brings me to my next question. So I've I've been reading this book called Writing for Your Life by Dina Metzger, and she says uh, there was a quote that was really interesting that I kind of wanted to share, which is um, there is an intrinsic relationship between creativity and self knowledge. 
Ultimately, one informs the other, and soon creativity and self-knowledge will seem like twin sisters, similar but distinct comrades who have a common origin. So kind of thinking about creativity and self-knowledge or self-awareness, I'm wondering how for both of you, those things are connected in your own artistic practice, or even just as you move through life. I think oftentimes a lot of creative projects can give us some insight into our own interests and passions as people. So yeah, I would love to just kind of hear about how creativity has impacted like how you know yourself as a human being or as an artist, however you wanna answer that question. So I would agree that they are twin sisters. And, um, you know, in my younger years, um, my younger years, um, I would, with my first novel, I would have defined myself as a writer of social justice, and I still am. But I would say I'm also a writer of healing because I'm about transcendence of our traumas. And in terms of like creativity and self knowledge, I would say that, um, you know, last decade, I have done a lot of, I, I have learned uh the language of the body and it's like this um we think about like can the subaltern speak i feel like the the the, the body itself it's it's voice is is there's a sub alternity in our own bodies and um how do we if that's always speaking through us through our thoughts through our pains and afflictions and how do we hear that and i do a lot of work on ancestral trauma. And so my own journey of becoming a healer and becoming, you know, somewhat fluent in the language of the body um, has really informed kind of how I write about this journey of transformation. So I would say the more that we are in touch with what's happening inside the macrocosm that we can then contribute to the Oh, microcosm <laughs> to the microcosm, the more that we can contribute to the macrocosm. When I was uh, hearing your question, I was thinking about the fact that the work that I do is to communicate through dance, through filmmaking, through academic writing. And I feel like the best way to communicate is through telling a story. And storytelling is a creative process that many people take a lifetime to master. Um, and so st storytelling and creativity produces knowledge, which then is uh, easily translatable to the, to the people who are receiving the knowledge. So when, while we, you know, storytelling is kind of more obvious in filmmaking settings, as well as in dance settings, I don't know that people necessarily think of academic writing as telling a story but I actually think it is telling a story. You're, you're opening with a problem, just like a film opens up with a problem at the end of act one, beginning of act two. You are sort of engaging with all the drama, the debates in your literature review. That's all of the, that's all of the conflict of your film. And then you're providing a solution or your own analysis or you're illuminating something at the end. So I think, in this sort of pursuit of producing knowledge, self-knowledge, um, creativity and storytelling is core to that no matter what uh, your outlet is. Yeah, totally. I mean, I kind of going a little deeper with that question too, like um, I'm wondering if either of you have like maybe specific examples of um, like a creative project, it can be writing or any other art form or art modality um, that sort of made you realize something about yourself or kind of, like developed your self-awareness or yeah self-awareness in a way that you maybe weren't expecting or didn't really think that that was going to happen you know being part of this healing journey has really involved a lot of self-inquiry and um I, I i took a class i studied with him um a shaman and um and being able to um, kind of, they describe it as when they're doing the drumming, you kind of slip out of the back of your mind into that, that realm, that cosmic realm in which you are um, um, accessing 
this other field to to receive answers and to do healing work. Um, for me, that has been an incredible experience of how even just like where is the portal, like finding the portal, what does this mean to you? Why is it the portal for you to then slip into this other world? Who are your guides making that connection? Um, what are they trying to show you? Um, what are the things inside you that you still need to overcome? Because so much of of our obstacles come from inside us. We talk about resistance as a force. It's not just outside us, it's really inside us as well. And so being able to see that in the metaphorical language of the shamanic journey allows a lot of self-revelation for me. I think for me, a creative project that I have learned a lot about myself in was as a part of Prakriti Dance, I danced in a production called Through Fish Eyes, which we premiered at the Kennedy Center in 2019. And simultaneous to that, I was making a documentary film about the process of creating the production. And that was doing the two side by side was definitely an unprecedented experience because while I would be in rehearsal, I was also trying to think, okay, what can I include today from our rehearsal or from our space that can go into the documentary? And I think the documentary, um, it has input from everybody, but I can speak for, for myself to say that it showed me what I valued in the creative process of a dance production and also what I value in the creative process of making a film. It sort of taught me a lot about who I am as an artist, doing the two side by side. Um, and so, yeah, bifurcating my brain in that way was very introspective. Yeah, that's cool. I think sort of a common theme in what both of you are sharing is just that different um, art modalities, but also just different experiences in general can kind of open up this awareness or insight of our potential that we really didn't even know existed or kind of reveal something about who we are now or who we want to develop into as people. Um, and I think that's actually a perfect segue into our experiential because I think I was sort of hoping for us to talk about some of these things or kind of work through some of these things. So I'm calling this activity role envisioning with animal imagery. Um, it sounds way more complicated than it really is, but uh, basically using the metaphor of like animals, um, I wanna invite us to dig a little deeper into our artist identities. So um, I have three like prompts and sentence starters. So I'm just gonna have us think of an animal for each of those and we'll start with that. And then I will explain part two. So the sentence starters, the first one is I am. The second one is I am not. And the third one is I want to be. So just to kind of give you an example, I might say, I am a zebra. I am not a raccoon, I want to be an elephant. So that's just an example of how you might sort of complete that. So we'll take a couple minutes, just kind of think about, you can write this down or type it or whatever you feel comfortable. Um, so I am, I am not, I want to be. So part two is, so now that we have these sentence starters completed, each of them with an animal, um, I'm gonna invite us to write a little poem. So um, you can add on to these three lines that we already have. So just one simple way of thinking about it. I have just like an example, if you're kind of having trouble. So um, if I use the first one for I am, like I am an elephant, and then I just add a phrase, it would, it would read, I am an elephant grounded and centered in the fullness of my being. So that's just kind of an example. It doesn't have to be very complicated at all. Um, I think if, if it's helpful, we can even stick to the same format of, or structure of like, I am and then a phrase, and then I am not, whatever animal you chose, and then a phrase, and then I want to be your animal, and then a phrase. So if you want to stick to that structure, that's totally fine. If you want to keep it more free flowing, I'm gonna leave it up to you because I think we all have very diverse writing skills and wherever you, your imagination wants to go, just let it flow.
Um, I'd love if we can share um, our poems and I wanna have us share it in two different ways. So we can, I think each share our like individual things. So each of the sentence starters with whatever phrase we added. And then um, I have another idea for how I wanna share after that, but we'll, we'll start there. Um, anybody wanna go first? Okay, so mine is, <clears throat> I am an owl, wise in waiting, perched in the highest branch of a summer tree. I am not a monkey, constantly jumping from here to there, scavenging for fruit. I want to be a tigress, fierce, fearless, huntress, queen of the jungle, amber eyes shining in the night. This is going to be a hard one to follow. <laughs> um... So, I am a rabbit, an energetic explorer full of movement, digging for and unearthing the details underdiscovered. I am not a sloth, waiting for things to happen. I want to be a giraffe with the big 20 foot big picture view. Love it, love it. Um, so I'll share mine. Uh, I am a zebra vibrant in the multiplicity of my being. I am not a raccoon, digging through that which was meant to be discarded. I want to be a horse, free-spirited, attuned, supportive. So uh, our, for our second way of sharing, I thought it would be really cool to kind of go in around and do all the I am's and then do all the I am nots, and then we'll end with the I wanna be's. So kind of taking turns. Um, and we can go in the same order too, Shopa, if you want to start. I am an owl, wise in waiting, perched in the highest branch of a summer tree. I am a rabbit, an energetic explorer, full of movement, digging for and unearthing the details not discovered. I am a zebra, vibrant in the multiplicity of my being. I am not a monkey, constantly jumping from here to there, scavenging for fruit. I am not a sloth, waiting for things to happen. I am not a raccoon, digging through that which was meant to be discarded. I want to be a tigress, fierce, fearless, huntress, queen of the jungle, amber eyes shining in the night. I want to be a giraffe with a 20 foot big picture view. I want to be a horse, free spirited, attuned and supportive. Yay, that was so cool. Um, how was that exercise for you both, the writing? Uh, lovely, I enjoyed it. Yeah, for me, you know, I think I think a lot about before I write. And so doing these kinds of exercises where you need to write in the moment and you need to write creatively is very, very challenging for me. So I enjoyed the challenge. Great, yeah. Hopefully this was like insightful and, um, you know, helpful in some way to you, but I'm, I'm glad that you both enjoyed it. So um, yeah, well, that brings us to the end of our episode, but I just wanted to thank you both so much for being here and for sharing about all of your wonderful insights with writing and with, healing and with just life in general I think life is also a process just like we say art is a process so um yeah thank you so much for being here it was really great talking to you both about your work thank you for having us this was a really uh, insightful conversation and it's always good to get ideas out with like-minded people yes thank you Ashwarya thank you Madhavi I feel like uh it's just wonderful to connect with other people who are doing process-oriented work, who are delving deep inside themselves and to connect and to 
to kind of give each other life force. And, and uh, I think that that's just such a beautiful experience. So I appreciate the work that you're doing in the world, both of you. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chai Side Chats with Madhavi and Shobha, as well as our animal imagery poetry at the end. Please do like, share, and subscribe to the Creativity Awakening YouTube channel for regular updates on our videos. If you want to get exclusive sneak peeks into our episodes and the creative process here at Chai Side Chats, you can check out our social media pages that are linked in the description below. Stay tuned. The next episode of Chai Side Chats will be premiering soon.